Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. Today I want to wrap up our discussion on measuring the velocity factor of transmission lines like coaxial cable. The first video in this series dealt with the what and the why of velocity factor and why do we care. And the three videos that followed I demonstrated how to de determine the velocity factor of a piece of transmission line using three different methods. The first one was using an antenna analyzer. The second one was using time domain reflectometry. And the third one was using a vector network analyzer. Now if you've been following this series, you might have noticed that while I was measuring the same piece of 93 ohm coax, I arrived at somewhat different values of velocity factor with each method. Well, the natural question that would come up with that is, well, why? If each method is a valid way to make the determination of the velocity factor of a piece of transmission line, then why don't I arrive at the same value regardless of how I measure it? Well, it's a valid question. And to begin with, when, when, uh, let's put this in perspective. Let's say I have a, a circuit that I'm, I'm using my voltmeter and I put my voltmeter probe on a particular place in the circuit. And our perception, our, our tendency to believe is that when we put that voltmeter probe on that spot in the circuit that whatever voltage the voltmeter is indicating is indeed the voltage that is on that point in the circuit. Well, that's not necessarily true. There are some things that affect the reality of that perception and it begins with the accuracy of the instrument itself. You see, there's no such thing as a perfect measurement instrument. Every instrument is accurate within some given tolerance. Some instruments are more accurate than other ones. So, like with the antenna analyzer, we were dependent upon two things. We were dependent upon the ability of that antenna analyzer to indicate the real frequency that it was applying to that piece of transmission line. We are also dependent upon its measurement accuracy as it was measuring the reactance value on that transmission line. Now, when I went out and looked for the claimed accuracy for the instrument that we used, I couldn't find anything in any of the documentation that says, well, the frequency readout is going to be within this tolerance and the measurement accuracy of the reactance is going to be within this tolerance. There just wasn't anything there. With the time domain reflectometry method, we are dependent upon the accuracy of the time base of the oscilloscope that we use to measure the time. Now, we used a Tektronix 585 oscilloscope and its accuracy on its time base was plus or minus 3%. This means that if my scope were within its tolerance, my measurement could vary by as much as 3% either side of the real value. With the VNA, much like the antenna analyzer, we're dependent upon its accuracy to indicate the real frequency it was applying as well as its measurement accuracy of the phase aspect. And that goes back to how we calibrate the VNA when we're getting ready to make the measurement. And in the case of the mini VNA Tiny, the frequency calibration is dependent upon you calibrating it. You have to take the the device under test port of the mini VNA Tiny connected up to a, uh, a frequency counter and then twiddle with some values until the frequency counter indicates the same frequency that the, the mini VNA Tiny thinks it is. So now you introduce the variable of the accuracy of the frequency counter. 
So you have the, the, the uh, accuracy that they're supposed to be, but then there's the actual accuracy. Well, what do, you, what do I mean by that? Well, as measurement instruments age, they don't necessarily stay within the stated accuracy of the instrument. They require regular and consistent recalibration to get them back into their original claimed accuracy. And the longer it's been since it has been done, the more suspect these measurements will be. They could be exactly right on, but not necessarily so. Then there's the effect of the measurement instrument itself. Every measurement instrument affects the circuit that you connect it to. Like in the case of the voltmeter, it will load down that circuit with its own circuitry. So that voltage might be higher or lower than it would be when you have the, don't have the, the uh, voltmeter connected up to it. And then there's the effect of the measurement methodology the test jigs that are used, the skill in the particular person making the measurement, all of these kinds of things. The, the, the methodology of doing the, the measurement itself can introduce errors, if not properly mitigated. And unfortunately, some of those things are unavoidable. So at this point, we ask ourselves the question, well, how much different were these measurements really? Well, as a point of reference, the coax that I used in my demonstration was RG180 with a rated impedance, according to the data sheet now, of 95 ohms and a velocity factor of 0 0.70. Now, because the VNA has the potential to calibrate out all of the effects of the test jig and the cabling and all of those things, we're going to assume that the VNA probably gave us the, the most accurate measurement in this case. Now, I performed the same measurement using my 1986 vintage, but recently calibrated Hewlett Packard VNA and compared the results to the Mini VNA Tiny. And there was a difference of a mere 0.35% which is about 1% away from the data sheet value. Well, how did the antenna analyzer and the time domain reflectometry do? Well, the antenna analyzer was low by 1.8% from the vector network analyzer and low by 1.1% from the data sheet. And the time domain reflectometry method was low by 1.5% from the ve vector network analyzer and low by 0.9% from the data sheet. So how do we accommodate these measurement issues? Well, in short, you make the measurement and then you initially cut your transmission line a little long and then trim to tune. In an application where the length of the transmission line affects the performance of the system it finds itself in, cut it at least 5% longer than the calculations indicate and then trim a little at a time. When I was playing around with a, a, a stub uh, band reject filter, I was trying to trim off an eighth of an inch at a time, and that frequency shifted significantly with, with each little eighth inch trim off. So a little is highly dependent upon the frequency that you're at because 5% on a quarter wave for a 7.25 megahertz uh, signal is on the order of about 14 inches, whereas 5% of a quarter wave with a 430 megahertz signal is on the order of a quarter of an inch. So obviously the trimming process is a little harder 
with a quarter wave stub at 430 megahertz. So maybe you might want to be a little bit more generous, add maybe a half an inch as opposed to a quarter inch or an inch, and then very carefully trim off a little at a time. It is an art after all. Now, another method is to add some variable entity to the system that allows you to adjust without trimming. This might be a little trimmer capacitor that you could put in or a variable inductor. I have here a, a feed line termination capacitor. You say that doesn't look like a capacitor. Well, the feed line connects up to this end and it has a rod here that goes in and out. And as that goes in and out, the capacitance that's measured at this end here changes. Putting that at the end of a stub effectively changes the electrical length of the stub and allows you to change the apparent electrical length of the of the stub without having to sit there with your clippers clipping off an eighth of an inch at a time. So check this out. Variable capacitor. No jury this morning. Nick, and as I change that pretty cool, huh? In the end you measure your transmission line's velocity factor as best you can with what you got. You calculate the lengths necessary to do what you're trying to do with your application. You purposely cut them longer than needed and then trim them as you tune. And then if you can use a device like this at the end of your uh, transmission line end of a stub somewhere in the system then that's a great way to to uh, make it easy to tune so now here's an example of what you can do once you know your feed lines velocity factor I created a band reject filter at 435 megahertz with a reject band width of 3 megahertz and a notch of almost 40 dB. And it was made with just a single open one quarter wave stub made out of some old coax that I had floating around here, some RG58. And what you're seeing in this picture is my ugly experimental version complete with a gutted stick pen that I used as a splint to hold it in place. Now, using similar techniques, you can create matching networks to fix the SWR of an antenna. I've actually done that. I had an antenna that just wouldn't tune and wouldn't tune and wouldn't tune, and I finally took my little mini VNA Tiny, carefully measured the impedance of the antenna, created a stub match uh, and at the end of that stub match going to the transmitter it was now about as close to one to one as you could get but without knowing the velocity factor of your coax you can't do things like that finally you can use feed line lengths to create phased antenna arrays so now the fun begins Go experiment. Thanks for watching. To Lutz.